Leopard gecko care guides can be pretty confusing. Different sources can give you wildly different answers to your questions. In this video, I'm going to tell you guys what you need to buy for your gecko and a few things that you should include as well. Check it out. A little side note before we start. I will try my best to include specific examples of products, but I can't guarantee their availability in your region. So it's not that hard to find a substitute if you need to. Before we start, the topics I'm going over today will include the tank, the lighting, the heating, the substrate, the food, the husbandry, and some more. Getting right into the first topic, the tank. The tank is the base of your enclosure. The enclosure should be no less than the size of a 20 gallon long tank, which has the dimensions of 30 by 12 by 12 inches. Depending on the size of your gecko, this may or may not be suitable. However, you're going to need to upgrade to a 40 gallon tank anyway or a similar size tank. Something around the size of 36 by 18 by 18 inches. The primary options here in the US at least are a front opening terrarium or a top opening fish tank, but both will work just fine. I recommend the front opening terrarium as I mentioned in my last video, because it allows you to store all your lamps and lighting on the top without having to take them off to open your tank. And it allows you to reduce the amount of stress you put on your gecko because they can see you opening the door. I'll be providing links in the description for products I recommend, so be sure to check those out if you're interested. The next topic I'll be covering is the lighting. Lighting helps to create a natural day-night cycle that your gecko would have in the wild. I have my lights turn on at 6 a.m. and then turn off at 6 p.m. Having a stable day-night cycle is healthy for your gecko because it allows them to distinguish what time it is so that they can eat and sleep at specific times. It practically builds them a schedule. It's best to get a UVB2 bulb because it allows them to create vitamin D3, which I'll go over later in the video. I use a Reftisun T5 5% high output bulb on a 5.5 inch riser from a shop on Etsy. If you're interested, there you go by Repti Riser, and I'll put a link in the description below. If you're using a T5 bulb like myself, you should replace it every year or so, but if it's a T8 bulb, you should replace it every six months. The bulb should be around two thirds the length of your tank. So if you have a 36 inch long tank like I do, Aim for around 24 inch bulbs. I'll have links in the description for lighting as well. Heating can be pretty difficult here in the US. Finding a good thermostat takes a relatively decent amount of time and they're pretty expensive. I would suggest a heating setup I use, which is a dimming thermostat and a deep heat projector. In my 36 by 18 by 12 inch tank, I use an 80 watt Arcadia DHP, which is a deep heat projector on a 600 watt Exoterra dimming thermostat. It's able to get my basking area to exactly where I want it at 95 degrees Fahrenheit without any problems. And it's able to maintain a nice temperature gradient in my tank. You want the hot end of your tank to be the mid to high 80s, the basking area right next to it to be in the 90s, and the cool side on the other side of your tank to be the mid to high 70s. I found that my tank got a little too cold at night. So just to be safe, I got an extra 100 watt ceramic heat emitter and put that on my thermostat at 75 degrees Fahrenheit just so I can keep my tank in that safe zone. Specifically at night, that is. When using any type of heat source, a thermostat should always be used. A DHP or a halogen bulb need a dimming thermostat. Any other bulb like a ceramic heat emitter or heat mat even can use on off or a pulse controlled thermostat, but it is definitely safer to, and better to go with a dimming thermostat because it allows it to send certain amounts of wattage to it so it can control the temperature better. Without a controlled wattage, the heat source could get too hot and cause a fire or burn your animal. When it comes to substrates, it gets pretty simple, so I'll get right into it. Using something like paper towels is good because they're cheap and easy to find, but it can be a pain to replace because you need to take everything out and you have to do that pretty often. Something like reptile carpet is easy to find and relatively affordable, but it needs to be cleaned thoroughly pretty often and it holds bacteria and it's kind of gross looking in my opinion. There have been a good number of people that say their leopard gecko's claws have gotten stuck in the fibers as well, so that is something you should take into account. Some people use vinyl tiles, but I personally wouldn't. I mean, they're better than paper towel and reptile carpet, but leopard gecko's more than often prefer a loose substrate that they can dig in, like the next substrate I'm going to mention. Loose arid substrates like Terra Sahara from the Biodude or Arcadia's Earth Mix Arid are definitely the best to use 
because they allow your gecko to dig and shape their terrain the way they want it to be. It also gives you the opportunity to go bioactive at any point, but that's a more advanced topic that I'm not going to get into in this video. The problem with these arid substrates are they can get pretty pricey. If you can't afford or rather make your own, stick to the 70 to 30 ratio of soil to play sand, but do some research on the soil and play sand you're using beforehand, because what I've seen is some are not exactly the best reviewed and like some soils will have plastic or rock in it and you don't want that. And some play sands might have mites, so just be careful. Leopard geckos refuse to eat anything but live insects from what I've seen, so you have to get those. When you buy your own insects, you have more control of what goes into them, so you know if your gecko is getting a healthy amount of nutrients or not. It's important because healthy food makes for a healthy gecko. I personally use rainbow mealworms mealworms, and I gut load them with carrots. I have about 2,000 of them in my fridge, which is set to 40 degrees Fahrenheit to slow down their metabolism. So their bodies don't need food as often and they don't molt as often. So that stops them from growing into beetles. When I'm ready to feed, I'll take out around 10 to 12 of them, mist them lightly with a spray bottle full of water, and then dust them with calcium and multivitamins. And then I'll either tong feed or put them on the ground for my gecko to hunt them. I do this about once a week. And it's important to note that you should have more than one source of food. Unfortunately, I don't but my gecko doesn't seem to mind mealworms. So that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. Earlier, I mentioned supplements such as multivitamins and calcium. These are important to have around because your gecko will need them to get proper vitamins. I use calcium without D3. The UVB bulb in my tank allows for my gecko to create its own D3 and thus doesn't need a supplement for it. D3 allows your gecko to absorb calcium so it doesn't have a risk of metabolic bone disease, which really is a very sad thing that happens to geckos and it's very unfortunate. Little jump cut here, I made a mistake. It doesn't just happen to geckos, it happens to almost all reptiles. Husbandry is another pretty simple topic. If you don't know what that is, husbandry is practically the decor that you have in your tank. There are some people out there that say leopard geckos don't climb. Do not listen to them. They do. What is this gecko doing? Oh my god. Bro, you can't be up there. What? Uh, don't jump, don't jump, don't do it, don't do it. Oh my god. Don't do it, don't do it. No. Uh, oh, you'll be fine. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave you be. I would just give them some things to climb over. If you have loose substrate, they'll dig in it. And other than that, they'll pretty much be fine. They aren't exactly the smartest animals and will entertain themselves pretty easily. But I do like to add a few fake plants to my tank to add some color. Food and water dishes are a must have. Well, not really food dishes because most bugs or food that you'll give your gecko will climb out or jump out. So I just use two water dishes and like I said before, tong feed my gecko. When you don't have a food bowl, your gecko will be able to quote unquote, hunt their own food and give them that extra bit of entertainment. A small dish or bottle lid for calcium is also nice because even if you've already dusted your food, it doesn't hurt them to have some extra calcium in there if their bodies tell them that they need it. You can make any of these dishes out of a bottle cap lid. It's pretty simple. Hides are an essential part of your tank. You need at least three hides. One on the hot side of your tank, one near the center but closer to the warmer side, which would act as your humid hide, and one on the cool side. The humid hide is filled with something like sphagnum moss and sprayed with water occasionally, or just when your gecko is going in the shed. I like to spray my tank occasionally when my gecko is shedding, just to get some extra humidity in there. The humidity lets them shed easier, and if you see your gecko wasn't shed, and has shed, but you don't see any of the skin, they most likely ate it. They eat it for some extra nutrition, but make sure to check their body for any stuck shed as that can cause the circulation to be cut off, leading to a loss of fingers, toes, or even full-on limbs. They lose part of their body, necrosis can occur, 
and caused much, much, much worse issues. But back to the main topic. You can also shape natural hides out of excavator clay, which looks nice, and is my leopard gecko's most used hide. But my other four hides are 3D printed using aquarium safe PETG filament, and I bought them off Etsy from Strudy's. You can also use cyanoacrylate glue, certain super glues, also known as CA glue, or silicone to hold pieces of slate together to form a slate rock hide. And that's pretty much all you'll need. Everything I talked about is essentially the basics and some of the important things that I found to be helpful based on my experiences. I would definitely suggest doing some extra research and not just watching a singular video. There are definitely better sources to get more info from if you want to put in that time. I hope I was able to help you guys find out information that you didn't know before and thank you for watching.